recorded these reviews eight years ago, and now it's time to finally finish this. Ugh. Nothing about that tastes right. It's a massive contradiction sandwich. <sighs> this better really be the end of these. I've hit my limit of all the Alice I can stand. I got a shot. He did a little prison break, fell off the boat, and was never seen again. <laughs> She was finally turned good again, went to help Alice fight in Washington, and was never seen again! He was completely wasted in the last movie! Probably the most important character in all of Resident Evil! Except Alice. And he used to be really important, but not so much anymore! Obviously went into Resident Evil, the final chapter, expecting something along the lines of the other movies, aka crap, but wow, Resident Evil, the final insult, managed to sink lower than I dared even dream. And in a series of cliche stock titles, I suppose the final chapter is pretty much the perfect thing to have called this. But of course that begs the question, is this really the final chapter? Is it really the final chapter? It is. Please don't be lying to me, Mila. I need this to be over. Anyway, they've already announced a reboot. Guess we'll see how that goes. They say that history is written by the victors. This, then, is the history of the Umbrella Corporation. Wow! We're not starting with the My name is Alice speech. Instead, we get a brand new Alice speech for this one. And they tell us right off the bat that she's going to be the victor. I mean, that's not really a surprise or anything, but that's less effort than even usual for this series. This intro feels straight out of another Dimensions continuity, as it does not fit with what we've been shown in Paul Anderson's Resident Evil movies at all thus far. And he's kept it so tied up until this point. We get introduced to James Marcus, who is a game character and one of the founders of Umbrella, but that's all he shares in common with his game counterpart. But ooh, look, a reference to the Arkley facility, aka where the first game took place. That's real cute at this point. Marcus had a young daughter, Alicia, afflicted with progeria. That's a real disease, but it doesn't quite work the way this movie depicts. By the time she was 25, Alicia would have the body of a 90-year-old. Marcus was driven to save her. Marcus discovered the T-Virus. Ah, we just started this movie. This is gonna be a long one. So, Alicia Marcus is the reason the T-Virus was made? Well, I suppose that'd be all well and good if you hadn't already have told us in Apocalypse that Angela Ashford was the reason the T-Virus was made by her father instead. When I was little, I had to walk on crutches. They said I'd never get better, just worse. He found a way to make me stronger. The T-Virus. But as long as you only sort of remember things, I suppose you'll be like, oh yeah, father trying to save his daughter. That's what the story always was. Repeating plot points and only half remembering things. That's the real story of these Resident Evil movies. Playing right to that point is the fact that Alicia Marcus is now who the Red Queen was based on the whole time. Well, pretend that this isn't the third face that has now been given to this character because those pesky girls playing her keep growing up. 
She's a holographic representation of the Red Queen, modeled after the head programmer's daughter. Programmer, one of the founders of Umbrella who made the T-Virus, it's all the same, right? It did seem kind of implied that the Red Queen was based off Angela Ashford in the second movie, but Dr. Ashford wouldn't have been the head programmer either, so it's never really made sense after the first movie. It was a miracle. The life of Alicia Marcus was saved. But it was not to be. Silent Hill got her. We then learned that Dr. Isaacs betrayed Marcus with his best buddy Wesker to kill him and take over Umbrella. Why is the already dead character of Isaacs now back and suddenly super important? Well, because Ian Glenn got himself all popular on Game of Thrones, silly. But of course, doing this storyline-wise creates a giant mess. So par for the course. To help him control the now vast interests of the Umbrella Corporation, Dr. Isaacs created a powerful artificial intelligence, the Red Queen. Guess Dr. Isaacs is now the head programmer. She's totally his daughter. Be sure to remember that he programmed her as well, as that's gonna make little to no sense as this thing goes on. The American government attempted to contain the outbreak by detonating a bomb. Seems Alice has become part of the Umbrella cover-up, though here she's really trying to save Paul Anderson's inconsistent story as Raccoon City was not blown up by the government. It was Umbrella. They did it both to try and contain the T-Virus outbreak and cover their own asses on the incident ever occurring and blamed it on a meltdown. Both of these things don't fit with the final chapter's story, which is why Alice is lying about the government doing it. My name is Alice, and this is my story. We know. It's boring already. The end of my story. Yay! Why did it take this long? Now, one thing we know about this series at this point is they rarely follow through with what they set up at the end of a movie. The end of two had Jill and company picking up Alice from Umbrella after she saved herself because other characters aren't allowed to do that much. But both Jill and Angela were not in the third movie or even mentioned. Extinction set up a giant Alice clone battle, which they did do, but of course they wrapped up very quickly in the first 15 minutes of Afterlife. And the end of Afterlife had Alice teamed up with Chris, Claire, and even stupid Kmart, and all three were swept away and not mentioned in the next film. Which of course leads us to Retribution's ending, which promised us a giant battle at the White House with Jill, Leon, Ada, and Wesker. Is that in the final chapter? What do you think? Of course not. The final chapter starts us off after this battle is over. This battle was the entire thing Resident Evil Retribution was leading up to, and it never happens. Like I said in my review of Retribution, the movie feels like a giant Act 1, which was bad enough, but now it's an Act 1 without a follow-up. Jill, Leon, and Ada aren't in this movie, or even mentioned as per the usual, making Jill a two-time vanishy. And all full of herself, this is my story, Alice, of course, doesn't mention them. Hell, she doesn't even mention her little clone daughter from Retribution either. Was she in the White House somewhere? Guess she's dead. Oh well, clones' lives don't matter, right? That's going to become especially ironic considering one of this movie's twists. There's a giant plaga-infested creature chained to the bottom of the lake for no discernible reason other than a lame jump scare and to show off how ugly a lot of the action in this movie is going to be filmed. Really close up and shaky. It honestly makes a lot of the action sequences in this film very hard to look at. Paul W.S. Anderson apparently thought he should at least throw one of those stupid T-virus-infected pterodactyls or whatever they are seen at the end of Retribution, so Alice runs over one in her jeep. This movie is so alienating. We're first given a backstory for a completely different series, then just thrown into Alice action sequences with no context for how she got there and no other characters. 
characters. This is my story. And it sucks! <laughs> Stupid explosion flying Alice. You know, I'm pretty sure part of this movie's script looked a little like this. Alice whispers loud noises. Explosion! Alice mutters. Explosion! Alice heh. Nah, it's just the Red Queen alarm, apparently, and she's finally going to exposition dump on us some of the new plot of this series. There are 4,472 humans remaining on the surface of the Earth. They will cease to exist in under 48 hours. Okay, this is the Red Queen's best guess on when the remainder of humanity will fall, right? But this movie acts like this is a definite time frame for when all the rest of the humans on Earth will die. Like they're all just sitting around looking at their watches saying, All right, in 48 hours, I'm letting those zombies eat me! Umbrella developed an airborne antivirus. If released, it would destroy the T-virus and anything it has infected on contact. Well, that doesn't seem like a deus ex machina at all! The antivirus serums in the films up to this point have been shown to be extremely unreliable. Except on the multiple little girls that the T-virus was created to cure. Well, sort of maybe, whatever. But the fact that antivirus sucks so bad was one of the reasons that the Red Queen didn't want to let anyone out of the hive. Because even if they used the antivirus, she couldn't be sure it would fully work. Why didn't you tell us about the antivirus? This long after infection, there's no guarantee it would work. But now she's just saying, oh, yeah, there's one that definitely works, and it just has to be released into the air. And the Red Queen would have had to have known about this the entire time because it's not a new development based on this movie's story. So, yeah, that only is a few plot holes big enough to throw an entire Alice clone army into. You mean my blood is the cure for all this? Correct. Not anymore! We've forgotten that plot point! Shut up! Wesker, he led you all here to Washington. He pretended to give you your powers back. And then, he betrayed you. What the hell was that? That's right, with one little line, they pretty much attempted to sweep away the entirety of the movie that came before this. The entire plot of Retribution was Wesker saving Alice and getting her to Washington so they could fight the Red Queen's army. None of that works now with the final chapter's plot. What have you said to me? Now I have need of you, the old you. So I've given you back your gift. Who was Wesker fooling here? Himself? Alice, ten years ago in the hive. We both failed. Make it right. The Red Queen is determined to destroy all life on Earth. Based on the story of the final chapter, Wesker spent the entirety of Retribution playing himself. He wasted time, money, and men to save Alice, a woman he didn't want to be saved. And he saved her from the Red Queen, who we are shown in this film he is still using despite her making secret plans with Alice, who the Red Queen spent all of the last movie trying to kill. It's just mind-boggling to me that these movies were written and directed by the same person. I... I can't believe. I can't believe. And yeah, I'm glad we're not going back to psychic powers, Alice, but how and why would Wesker lie about that? You would think that Alice would know right away if she's back to full God Alice status. So yeah, she's only a demigod again in this movie, not a full one. I feel the need to mention it because I didn't before that the T-cells in Alice were actually T's. It was so stupid, I guess it didn't even register with me first. I'm resetting your watch. Oh, why the hell would Alice have an umbrella watch that the Red Queen can remotely program? I mean, other than our new plot's convenience. But Alice is a moron to still be wearing something like that. Where's this antivirus? In the hive. Alice has to go back to the hive because.
because of what I told you about before. These movies loving to repeat things and only half remember them. I always knew that the climax would be a return to Raccoon City, to the Hive. Oh, did ya? Because I'm pretty sure you didn't back when he was getting blown up along with the rest of Raccoon City at the end of two. Ooh, an umbrella brand motorcycle. That seems like an obvious trap. Even Alice wouldn't be that stupid. <laughs> Well, I guess she still does wear umbrella tech despite them having open access to it, so Alice isn't very bright. Project Alice, why did you turn against umbrella? Because you would waste resources on things like having people hide in boxes by motorcycles on the highway just to try and catch people in little traps. Well, as this movie now proves, we are pretty dumb and wasteful. So you'd think that this means that Alice is now caught at this point. But nah, this is just a scene to show us how powerful not powered back up Alice is. Like you said, the character in this movie, the sixth movie, is a very different woman to the character in the first movie. But that's a character that has grown organically. You're right. She's grown from normal, relatable person with training to Mary. Sue to a god to demigod who's still never really in trouble despite being put in ridiculous situations. Perfect growth. <laughs> Moron sandwich. Someone give that motorcycle a raise. It is now the most competent member of Umbrella. Anyway, Alice is now really captured by Umbrella, but she's not dead because. because. because she's Alice, stupid! Besides, we gotta kinda do some Mad Max-like scenes because Fury Road was popular. Let's just forget that we already did Alice Beyond Blunderdome in the third movie. I killed you. Yet here I am. I killed your clown. The clones were literally off the rack in the last movie. You can't play clones as a twist anymore, you stupid movie series. Bad writing rears its ugly head once more as Isaacs and Alice immediately act like it's personal between the two of them, despite these two iterations of the characters not having met before this point. Isaacs also has a drawer full of Alice. Alice clone heads. At what point would there have been any Alice clones to go after him? Alice took her clone army over to Japan and they all died. And the other Alice clone facility had them playing house and dying. Until Alice blew all the rest of them up. Unless Isaacs made some more Alice clones and gave them the knowledge and opportunity to go after him himself, they never would have done so. And if all that that stupidity had happened, they would have been a bigger challenge than regular Alice here, as her clones all had her full superpowers based on the battle in Japan. She's an unbeliever. What do we do with unbelievers? Cast her out. Oh yeah, Isaacs is now some kind of religious zealot or something. That's necessary. So what else is he gonna do but not kill Alice and instead put her in a situation where she can escape? Of course, this doesn't look like a situation someone should be escaping from, but it's Alice. And Isaac should know how much she cheats if he actually did kill some of her clones. This is another one of those overblown to the point of ridiculousness scenes with the zombies and just makes them feel not threatening in the slightest. You throw an entire army of them at Alice and I just stop caring, especially because it's not that big of a bother to her. And therefore you've made light of what is supposed to be one of the biggest threats in the Resident Evil universe! 
Of course, the Resident Evil movie series is more about clones and lasers than it is zombies, so who really cares about them? It would appear your mission to Washington was less successful than you made out. Well, Wesker wouldn't have had to have done that mission in Washington at all if he didn't bother saving Alice. They could have just killed her when she is captured at the beginning of that film, but nah, Wesker to send in people and blow up his own facility to save a woman he didn't want saved as of this movie, because that makes sense. I don't work for Umbrella anymore, and neither does Albert Wesker. Except he does. Well, Alice escapes via close-up shaky cam with the occasional fur shot to remind us that zombies don't really matter at all. Then, Alice decides she should try the motorcycle for the third time. <laughs> Oh, if only. You can't escape! Well, that sure came in handy! <laughs> Sorry. In the third movie, Isaacs used a bunch of antivirus and T virus to try and save himself, eventually turning himself into a tyrant, but now, apparently, while Umbrella is extremely short staffed and low on resources, which they were complaining about in that same third movie, they have somehow developed the magic Grow Your Hand Back sack. Pops right back in nice and easy. Oh my god! I love palling around with my best buddy, the Red Queen. Seems just a movie ago that I was palling around with the good guys to try and stop her from killing everyone. So, the indication at the end of 2 was Raccoon City's pretty much wiped off the face of the Earth, but now we see that there's just a crater in the middle of it. Guess a lot of zombies probably survived that then. Umbrella know they can't contain the infection. So it's sunrise this morning. Precision tactical nuclear device. What yield? Five kilotons. It'll destroy the infection. And all eleven and seven. So no one's particularly worried about fallout or anything from that then? Alice gets taken in by a group of survivors held up in a building with some of them not trusting her and stuff, and oh, our only returning good guy character, Claire, is with them. Good thing this doesn't feel at all like a truncated version of when this similar situation happened in Afterlife or anything. Resident Evil Afterlife is a traitor. No Chris downstairs this time to play Prison Break, though, as Wentworth Miller was busy making more actual Prison Break. I love, though, that he apparently thought the Prison Break connection in Afterlife was a joke at first. So, is Claire gonna mention her brother Chris or her buddy Kmart she was last seen with in the fourth movie? Of course not. What movie series do you think this is? No one matters but Alice. Speaking of not mattering, that's this entire group around Alice. They are barely characters and mostly here just to add to the body count. Aw, and there's some kids there too. That's nice. They die. Oh, Claire is kind of seeing Beardy McGee here. I only mention it because it's a minor plot point later. Umbrella developed a cure. An airborne antivirus. Who told you this? The Red Queen. And you believed her? Yeah, I like her now because she's played by my and Paul's daughter. And they infected you with the T-virus. You release this antivirus, it's going to kill you. Whatever it takes. Oh, don't raise our hopes like that, final chapter. No, I'm right. Yes, of course we do, Alice. It's your world. We just live in it. We don't have long. All those survivors are definitely dead or alive based on that counter. Isaacs leads the swarm of zombies over to Alice and friends because apparently Umbrella has nothing better to do with its very limited resources. Which, of course, they don't help when they plan operations against themselves just to fool the audience, apparently. And how exactly did he know where she went? Guess she just went in a straight line, or this building is the only one that looks like it houses anyone in the entirety of Raccoon City. And once again, this battle is completely overblown as it takes zombies in the hundreds to apparently even be a slight threat. 
It's shaky, zoomed in too far, and ugly to look at. And now at night, it's also dark, so that makes it even worse than before. This really is the worst of the series as far as the stylistic choices go for the action sequences. It doesn't help, of course, when the story driving that action is crap, but I'd say hands down this is the worst it's ever been, and it's to the point where it might hurt some people's heads to look at. Explosion, 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 a bunch of the no-names die, shuckity shuck. Then they try to up the stupid with a giant fireball down a tower of zombies. It's just too much and too silly. It would take me right out of this movie, if it ever gave me a chance to get into it. Now don't forget your Resident Evil savior, St. Yannis Prospero! Oh yeah, the whole Yanis Prospero thing is definitely out now, too. You're fast, but you're not too smart. <gasps> now time to try this motorcycle one more time! <laughs> oh, the irony of... That guy now having to be the zombie bait. Of course, it should actually have been Isaacs, but they need him for some more stupidity later, so it can't be the actual guy who forced Alice to do this. Two more armies of undead. The undead have heat signatures? Shouldn't they not? Whatever. Alice and her merry band of cannon fodder finally head on over to the hive, which now is a nice and easy access point due to the raccoon butthole in the middle of the city. But before they get there, a few of the losers get picked off by Cerebrus dogs in a scene that, you know, is kind of like the opening scene of the first game where they're running for the mansion from the Cerebrus. But if they had already burned an entire tower of zombies before that point and given you a headache so that you barely care. Once they get to the tunnel though, the dogs just stop because that's past their loading zone. Or they're scared of the air tunnel, which is what the movie actually says. Maybe they're scared. I really wonder how well this air tunnel worked before there was a crater in the middle of the city, because either it would have been sealed, or there would have been a giant tunnel leading to a secret lab in the middle of the city! What the hell are we gonna do down here? You're all going to die down here. Nah, she's good and loves all of humanity! She'd never say that to Alice! Project Alice! You're all going to die down here. Except in the last movie. So, will they all die down here? Find out next time! That definitely Alice won't. Zombie Sandwich. They've really taken the joy out of sandwiches.